I first started uh, reading Korzybski only about three years ago. Uh, and I came across this passage in Science and Sanity that some of you, uh, well, maybe have read, memorized, but certainly know well. Um, let us repeat the two crucial negative premises <coughs> as established firmly by all human experience. One, words are not the things we are speaking about, and two, there is no such thing as an object in absolute isolation. These two most important negative statements cannot be denied. If anyone chooses to deny them, the burden of proof falls on him. He has to establish what he affirms, which is obviously impossible. We see that it is safe to start with such solid negative premises, translate them into a positive language, and build a non-Aristotelian system. Well, when I read that, I almost dropped Science and Sanity, which is, would, be, would be a horror, right? Uh, and and uh, a few things, a bunch of things, jumped out at me all at once. Um, Korzybski's uh, premises are two in number. They're crucial to his system of thought. They're universal, he claims, to human experience. The first premise is about the reference of terms, and the second is about the state of objects humans encounter. Um, the reason that each of these factors jumped out at me was that a large part of my graduate work uh, was focused on a school of Buddhism called the Yogacara. Uh, yesterday, Tim Lyons uh, mentioned the Madhyamaka. Well, the Yogacara and the Madhyamaka uh, were competing schools of Mahayana Buddhism. They're the two schools. Um, well, the Madhyamaka won in the, uh, in the end. But for a few hundred years, uh, the ideas I'll present today uh, had a significant uh, number of followers originally in India and later in China and Tibet. So a few hundred years is a pretty good run. Um, so one particular bone of contention, perhaps the largest one, uh, was the best way to conceive of emptiness, which the Buddha spoke about a lot. Um, as Buddhist scholars might put it, with regard to the emptiness of the Yogacara, there are two. Um, first, an object's absence of being established by way of its own character as a referent of terminology or of a conceptual consciousness. And two, the emptiness of apprehended objects and apprehending subjects existing as different substantial entities. So in a few moments, I'll speak about what these emptinesses imply and how they fit into Buddhism in general and Yogacara Buddhism in particular. But for now, I just want to highlight that these emptinesses um, are also two assertions, also crucial to their system of, of thought, also considered by them universal to human experience. The first is about the reference of terminology, and the second is about the state of objects humans encounter. As I continue to read Science and Sanity, a number of other parallels uh, with my Buddhist studies occurred to me, but this parallel was by far the most intriguing. So I've chosen Krzyzewski's famous structural diagram as a model of human experience to help examine the parallel and to highlight at least one significant difference with the Chogachara system uh, of thought. As many of you will know, this uh, simplified version of the diagram shows us a relationship between the level of events in the world, the objects we encounter, sorry, the objects uh, we extract from, from the event level, the verbal descriptive level, and the level or levels of inference we build up. First, I want to make some distinctions about these levels. Korzybski uh, tells us that everything we have direct knowledge of starts and ends with the object level, which decidedly is inside our nervous system, the bottom three quarters of the slide. Um, as the recognizable part of the event, the object is our first order, order abstraction of the event level. We further abstract the silent level of raw experience um, uh, via description, terminology, um, and then finally we make inferences about what we've described and inferences about these inferences and so forth. So while most of what is going on in the world at the event level is outside of our nervous systems, uh, the nervous function of the brain, uh, represented by just below the line, uh, perhaps, uh, are of course also part of the event level. Uh, as the dotted line indicates. While the nature of the event level is uh, not explicit in Korzybski's premises or the Yogacara emptinesses, the formulation of both sets of assertions is deeply informed by their differing beliefs about what's going on at the event level. Uh, the event level at the top is a bit mysterious. For millennia, we have known about it only from 
abstracted reports from our senses. The Western idealistic philosophers such as George Barclay uh, struggled to explain what underlies our perceptions and what keeps the world going when nobody is watching, nobody's around to perceive it. In modern times, uh, this sense information has been greatly supplemented uh, by reports from scientific instruments. For example, the electron microscope for the first time revealed the structure of a virus. But again, we have no direct knowledge of this event level, still via reports. Perhaps there is a materialistic world out there, as most of us probably believe. Or maybe our consciousnesses are experiencing a simulation of some kind, as depicted in the Matrix. Another Matrix reference today, you know, this, this weekend. Or maybe somebody else uh, or something else is providing us with these reports. Krzyzewski's premises and the Yogachar emptinesses deal directly only with the mental object, description, and inference levels. So let's take a look at the premises and emptinesses on the anthropometer structural diagram, or the educational appliance as it was patented. Once again, Krzyzewski's premise one is words are not the things we're speaking about, and second is no, no such thing as an object in isolation, absolute, absolute isolation. And again, the Yogachara emptinesses are the absence uh, of an object uh, being established by way of its own character as a referent of terms or of thoughts. And, and, and two, uh, the emptiness of apprehending objects and the subjects apprehending them existing as different substantial entities. So um, the first emptiness tells us, just in summary, that objects um, are not the reference of our words and thoughts because of the character of the object. The second says that we're not cut off from the objects. By, despite seeming that we are all cut off from objects, we are not cut off the way we, we, we perceive. The most crucial universal thing in Buddhism is emptiness, since emptiness is the final object of meditation, which leads to enlightenment for all sentient beings. It's the goal. But does this not mean some, this doesn't mean rather, some kind of emptiness in general, as it's popularly portrayed, right? Emptiness. Uh, in, instead, it's an emptiness of something very specific, a particular false status we give to objects that must be excised precisely like a tumor in the mind. So a central concern of the various Buddhist tenet systems was the identification of the correct object of negation, the target of meditation. If you get it wrong, it won't help you. This is what they were arguing about for centuries. Furthermore, to be effective, it was thought that this negation must not imply or otherwise replace that which we are negating with something else. A famous uh, example uh, is there was a, a relative of the Buddha called Devadatta. And uh, the example they used um, uh, was uh, of an affirming negative is the fat Devadatta does not eat during the day. The fact that he's fat implies that he must eat some other time, perhaps during the night. So we don't want a, a negation like that. We want something that just says this, no. So emptiness must be a non-affirming negative. The incorrect status of objects must be eliminated completely without implying that some other status should take its place of this incorrect status. The object of meditation must be uh, the complete elimination of the false way of engaging with reality that draws us into attachment and suffering. Negativity is thus intrinsic to the eliminative goal of the emptinesses of the Yogacara. And as for Krzyzewski, we saw earlier in the passage I read that it's very important that his premises be stated in the negative to act as a firm foundation for his system of general semantics. So I hope it's clear now that I've covered the first few uh, check marks, right? Um, two negative sets of assertions thought to be crucial, universal to human uh, uh, nature. Um, but what, what about reference and objects, right? Um, hopefully I can establish that as well. So this part is sort of 101, hopefully review. Uh, the silent level of sense objects is what we're speaking about uh, since it contains everything we sense about the world. The descriptive level is where the spoken word occurs and it's a separate, separate level abstracted from objects, right? Uh, the, the structural diagram demonstrates premise one very clearly, not surprising. Premise two is also illustrated clearly on the diagram. The strings show the relationships between characteristics and their abstractions. Uh, objects exist to us only in these relationships. As first order abstractions, we can only uh, describe objects by making second order abstractions. So an object that's absolutely isolated makes no sense. Well, what about the Yogacara? What are they saying? 
again, emptiness one, I know it's a little wordy, an object's absence of being established by way of its own character as the referent of terms or thoughts. So an object is the referent of terminology. If you ask for an apple, someone might well pass you an apple. So reference work. We're not nihilists here. That was part of the discussion. Are you being nihilistic if you say some of these things? Um, in the diagram, the string between description and object levels also shows this relationship that we're quite familiar with. Also, an object um, is the referent of thoughts, right? You can think about it, an, an apple is delicious or green, and, and that's, that's real. We're not denying the reality of your experience. But for the Yogacara, the character of the object, for example, abstracted from the event level, right, is not the reason. Instead, they assert that we impute characteristics onto objects without depending on anything outside of the mind. So the greenness and the deliciousness and the name apple are not based on the character of the object. Instead, our minds impute these characteristics onto the apple object in the mind. So here we see this first Yogacara emptiness clearly diverge from Korzybski's premise one. Korzybski accepted, we think, right, that there was an external right. world out there uh, of some kind that is the basis of our uh, sense experience objects. So I uh, took the liberty of, of suggesting that um, Krzyzewski, if he were to point out a direction, would say that uh, abstraction is from objects, for example, the object level to the description level, from the uh, event level to the object level. So the arrow is tiny, but uh, it, it, it's if we had to choose a direction, we might say that. The Yogacara, however, um, they thought opposite. We're, we're imputing from description to object. Um, the Yogacara did not accept that there is an external world beyond what we can sense. So the Yogacara, this, this caused some controversy among Buddhist you know, debaters, right? You're saying there's no world out there? Come on. Uh, and they lost, like I said, so it's a, it, was a tough, it was a tough room that they would always try to speak to. Um, so, uh, yeah, the Yogacara didn't posit an event level at all. Their doctrine was also called Chittamatra, or mind only, uh, sometimes derisively, I'm sure, because they asserted that all we experience is not based on hidden le event level at all, but instead on hidden additional consciousness. Um, uh, Tim referred to this uh, yesterday. They call it a storehouse consciousness. Uh, storehouse consciousness. Um, so they equated this consciousness that creates objects along next to the touch consciousness and the smell consciousness and the eye consciousness. There was a, an, they had eight of them, and, and one of them was uh, the Alia Vijnana, which is this storehouse. Um, karma determines experience in the Buddhist uh, metaphysics. Um, specifically, it was thought that karmic seeds, that was the metaphor they used, emerge from this storehouse in your mind and ripen to create both the perceiving consciousness, what you're thinking, like the you in the thinking experience, and what you're thinking about or what you're perceiving. So you are creating a, uh, an object and a subject right now. Um, so uh, this worldview that does not posit an event level informs the second emptiness as well, namely the emptiness of apprehended objects and apprehending subjects existing as different substantial entities. If the mind produces both the perceiving subject and the perceived object, then the task for uh, the Yogacara is for us to realize this on a deep level. Objects commonly appear to us to be out there, distant, cut off, but according to the tradition of the Buddhists, when advanced yogis came out of meditative sessions, they reported having had a direct realization of this non-duality of subject and object. So while the second emptiness may appear to be dry, it came out of the very wet experience of, of meditative practitioners, uh, advanced Buddhist yogis. Yogacara literally means yogic practice school. It was thought that the emptiness uh, concerning a reference was a gateway actually to the second one of non-duality. So they, they focused first on the idea of names and even uh, other sense experiences um, being not from uh, the object but being imputed. Uh, in Science and Sanity, um, just, just to speak of reference, right, uh, premise one and emptiness one are, have to do with the reference, uh, I contend. Um, Krzyzewski said, one of the most pernicious ha bad habits uh, that we have acquired emotionally from the old language is the feeling of allness or concreteness, 
in connection with the is of identity and elementalism. So an uh, apple is not an apple, right? Empty as one also resets the structure of the linguistic world to link it to the objective. Since we impute characteristics onto objects, Yogacara would contend, we must realign our understanding with this imputation by meditating on this, just deeply concentrating, convincing ourselves of this. So an apple is an apple, sure. You, you might get past one if you ask for one, but not by way of its own character. There's nothing innate about the apple that means we should call it that. Or think of it as red, or think of it as delicious. So on the uh, impossibility of an absolutely isolated object, Korzybski said, uh, obviously, for a man to speak about anything at all always presupposes two objects at least, namely the object spoken about and the speaker. So a relation between the two is always present. So this dualism contrasts sharply with the Yogacara non-dualism. For the Yogacara, the relation between the object spoken about and the speaker was a non-difference in entity, right? Um, and again, they didn't say one entity. They felt it was very important to, to put things in the negative as well. Um, in the sense that Yogacara were saying that we, what we perceive is only in our consciousness, they're saying less than Korzybski because notice where the object is, is in the mind. But in the sense that Yogacara were saying that an additional consciousness produces both subject and object, that's, that's quite a big bit of a larger claim. Um, lastly, uh, Korzybski on his own, uh, I, I feel, seems to have gained an insight which almost blends the Yogacara emptinesses concerning reference and emptiness uh, of the objects as different substantial entities. Uh, so I'll leave you with this. Um, if we use a language of adjectives and subject predicate forms pertaining to sense impressions, we are using a language which deals with entities inside our skin and characteristics entirely non-existent in the outside world. Thus, the events outside our skin are neither cold nor warm, green nor red, sweet nor bitter, etc. But these characteristics are manufactured by our nervous systems inside our skins as responses only to different energy manifestations, physical, chemical, chemical processes, etc. When we use such terms, we are dealing with characteristics which are absent in the external world and build up an anthropomorphic and delusional world, non-similar in structure to the world around us. That's, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> Clap now. Thank you.